we're in year number 40. We know of over a hundred people we've converted as a result of this program. And I quit counting about 15 years ago. Now, of those that have been converted, six of them are denominational preachers. Now, one of them helped us on the rise to truth for quite a while, Mac Bennett, before his death. And then on our summer series, two men that have appeared on it are converts from the radio program. Two of the converts, members of a denominational church, heard their preachers speaking one to another, saying they'd like to take Eddie Kraft and me out behind the building and beat the tar out of us. I recommended him go first. <laughs> <laughs> and so they thought, what in the world are those guys teaching? They must be blaspheming the Holy Spirit and everything. So they got to listening and became converted. And she, he, he's passed away. She was a member here at Stony Creek for quite a while. And these are some of the things that have taken place. One of the preachers converted was a Pentecostal preacher in Kentucky. They would listen to a rise to truth as they'd go pick their son up. And he said, that's the dumbest bunch of people I've ever heard in my life. I'm going to study my Bible and I'm going to prove them wrong. And so he got to studying, and the wife asked him one day, how you doing? Well, not so good. About everything I check on, they're right. He was converted. Now, I never had the privilege to meet him, but Eddie Kraft did. And they went over, the Pentecostal people, trying to get him back. And said, we'd love to have you back. He said, now look, if it was a personal matter, we ought to work this out. But this is not personal. It's doctrinal. And the only way that I can preach for you is you give up the things that are unscriptural, just like I gave them up. And so when these people are converted, they become very zealous, it seems like, for the cause of Christ. Two of those men I mentioned a moment ago, one was an elder where Bill preached, and the other, is he an elder over at Lebanon? Yes. He's an elder at Lebanon and also does some preaching. Now, we're convinced the way to go with radio or TV, if you can do it, is live. People love live talk shows. And this is what we chose to do, and we chose to go on a religious station. Why? Because that's where people are that care about God. That's kind of like going into the synagogue. Go where people are who are concerned about God. And so we chose WZAP because it was a religious station. Now, we did the Arise to Truth radio program and TV program, and that's a trip, live out of Chattanooga. And we had tremendous success with it. And again, it's because of the live nature of it and people being able to call in and say anything they want to say to you. Like the guy that called and said, you're the stupidest human being I think I've ever heard in my life. I've never met anybody dumber. I said, wait a minute, buddy. Hold on. Eddie, the call's for you. <laughs> you know? I knew he had the wrong man. He wanted Eddie. So I had to let him talk to Eddie. Now, Eddie and I also have met with other preachers who are convinced that what they're preaching is wrong. This one preacher told Eddie and me, said, last night a young lady came forward to be saved. 
Now, he preached for a big denominational church. He said, you know what I told her? I told her, if you want to know, know what to do to become a child of God, you call Eddie Craft or Wesley Simons, and they'll tell you. Now, you think about people preaching for denominational churches that are telling people that come forward, you need to talk to somebody else if you want to be right in the sight of God. So these are a few of the things that I wanted to share with you. I got a whole lot more that I'd like to share with you, but the clock's running out. We've, we've still got another minute here. This has become an important part of what we do at the school. Why don't you tell them how the students get involved? Yes, we let the students appear on the program. And there's one rule, no matter who you are, if you appear on this program, you don't ever tell anything that you cannot prove with the thus saith the Lord. Because just as sure as you open your mouth, they're going to call and jump on us about it when they know that we don't have book, chapter, and verse for it. This is a book, chapter, verse program. And that's why it's so important that we're able to establish what we teach. Wesley, tell them how they can get a hold of the program where they are. They can do, listen to Rise to Truth or watch it every Tuesday and Thursday. I'm going to let Bill do that. Okay. You can go to Facebook and look up Arise to Truth. Ethan, is it radio program or just Arise to Truth? Arise to Truth radio program on Facebook or on YouTube every Tuesday and Thursday from 2 to 3 Eastern time. We have two classes a year where students participate in the program. We have a debate class, and we also have a media class, and perhaps we'll have more time to tell you about that. But it's a very, it's a very <coughs> important aspect of the school now for the students to learn how to be involved in media, not just radio programs, but podcasts and things of that nature. I'll mention this one thing. Recently, Jared Jackson wrote an article and I don't remember the exact statistics, but it was, I believe it was 70% of Gen Z, and that's the generation that's coming on right now, 70% get all the religious information from podcasts. So we need to be involved in that. Local preachers need to have a local program. All right, we're going on in about 13 seconds here. Those of you that are joining us now by Facebook and YouTube, we appreciate so much you joining us. We're going to be looking at the book of Titus, so if you have a Bible, please be turning there. And our program will focus on the book of Titus and showing Jesus Christ and his role in uh, what's going on in the book of Titus. And we appreciate so much you joining us. So get your Bible, pencil, piece of paper ready, and take notes and send us any question or comment that you might have relative to the program. You did well. Thank you. Good afternoon and welcome to the Arise to Truth radio program coming to you live from the campus of the Tri-City School of Preaching and Christian Development. We appreciate so much you making the decision to participate with us today in the study of the greatest of all books, the inspired, inerrant, perfect will of God. My name is Bill Haywood and I serve as the director of the Tri-City School of Preaching and Christian Development. Also on the program today. I'm Wesley Simons, and I'm the co-director of the Tri-City School of Preaching and Christian Development. And I'm Eddie Kraft. I'm one of the instructors of the Tri-City School of Preaching and Christian Development here in beautiful Elizabethan, Tennessee. I'm David B. Jones. I preach for the Shady Valley Church of Christ in Shady Valley, Tennessee, and also I serve as an instructor here at Tri-City School of Preaching and Christian well, Development. It's great to have these men. It's great to have you as well. Once again, thank you for being part of the Bible study today. Get your Bibles out. Turn them over to the book of Titus. We'll be looking at some great truths from the book of Titus. We're going to be noticing that Jesus is the great God and Savior in the book of Titus. Now, normally, we're broadcasting from our studio here on the campus of the Tri-City School of Preaching and Christian Development. But today, we're in the auditorium of the Stony Creek Church of Christ. This week is our lectures and uh, so we're broadcasting in the auditorium, and we have folks here in the auditorium as well. 
and we've invited them to participate. But let me invite you to participate as well. You may have a question. You may have a comment. You're welcome to call us, and we would invite that. The number is 423-512-9226. 423-512-9226. Now, Wesley, we, as we begin this study, verse number 13, I believe, is the launching pad that you wanted to use. And that verse says, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And Wesley, we need to dis define some things as we get into our text today. Let's talk about this idea of the blessed hope. What is that blessed hope? Well, first of all, Bill, from this verse, we have things to look forward to. And when we think of the blessed hope, we're talking about biblical hope. You know, you can walk up and down 91, knock on the doors of various people, and ask them, do you hope to go to heaven? Oh, yeah. They hope to go to heaven. But is their hope biblical? Biblical hope is not only desire, but expectation because you're doing what God says do. So that's the kind of hope that one has got to have. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more in a moment. And also, we look forward to his glorious appearing. Now, it amazes me as you listen to these denominational preachers talk about an angel spoke to him, God spoke to him, uh, Jesus Christ spoke to him, as if though they're talking to their next door neighbor. My, my, I'm going to tell you all something. If an angel suddenly appears right here to tell me something, I'll be in the floor. Or if Jesus did or God did, because I've never been around to being that great. Well, when Jesus Christ appears, though it's going to be a blessing to all of us, you know what we're going to do? Fall to our knees. And we're going to confess who he is to the glory of God Almighty. Now, everybody's going to confess the Christ. Either confess him unto salvation or confess him unto damnation. And that is, they chose not to confess him. They were disobedient. And when he appears, it's going to be too late to confess him unto salvation. You know, Eddie, this, this is an interesting word, this word hope. Mm -hmm. It means looking forward to something with a rational confidence. It's Absolutely. not just wishful thinking, That's right. but there is a basis for that hope. Yeah, and looking. You know, for the hour we think not, the Son of Man will come. So if we're not anticipating, anxiously awaiting, looking for every moment His return, then there's a great chance He'll catch us by surprise and we'll be walking in darkness. We want to be ready. And, and one of the ways we do that is by anxiously looking. I mean, that's going to be a glorious time. We're going to see Him as He is. We're going to become like Him. And when you think about how beautiful that is, that gives us... As the little boy said, that gives me something to look forward to. And when we have the fact that he's coming again, as he promised in Acts 1, and uh, that being true, we anxiously await. We look for his appearing every single day. And if we do that, we'll continually be blessed. When Paul wrote to the Philippian brethren, at the end of chapter 3, he said to them, for our citizenship is in heaven. Now, of course, he was in a Roman prison, the, the head of the, the center of, the, of that world. Right. But he said, our citizenship is in heaven from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, eagerly wait, Damn. who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. So we're supposed to be eagerly waiting, but we won't be eagerly waiting if we're not ready. That's right. Getting sense, we won't be. That's because right. we'll be trying to get ready because when he comes, it's going to be too late to do anything about it unless you're ready to go right then. Absolutely. You know, I, I was as we were talking about that, the thought came to my mind, what kind of day will that be? And what kind of event will that be? And largely, that will be determined on whether you have been looking 
for that blessed hope, whether or not you are prepared for that day. If you're not prepared for that day, it will be the most horrible day beyond description. But if you are prepared, it's the day you've been waiting for. Let's get started with the text. I'll read a couple of verses here. And then, Wesley, let's talk about some of these phrases in verse 2. I'm going to start in verse number 1. Paul a bondservant, an apostle of Jesus Christ according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledgement of the truth which accords with godliness in hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began or before the world began. Why don't you break down some of those phrases? Okay, Bill, let's look at the phrase in hope of eternal life. God gives us eternal life in hope. We don't have it yet in reality. Now, those who teach once saved, always saved, they teach you've got it now. You've got it in reality. Well, if that's true, then this verse is incorrect. This says in hope of eternal life which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. Now, I was doing this program, oh, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago, when a denominational preacher called in who believed in once saved, always saved, and I asked him, do you have eternal life now? He said, absolutely. I said, would you read for me Mark 10, 30? Do you know he would not read the Word of God? I begged him. I pleaded with him. And then I was going to get him to read for us these verses right here that Bill just read. Notice Mark 10, 30. But he shall receive a hundredfold In this time, houses and brethren and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecution. Now watch this. And in the world to come, eternal life. I was going to ask him if Jesus told the truth when he said that eternal life is in the world to come. He would not read the verse, so I read it. And then I said to the audience, here's why he would not read it. Because the Word of God says clearly that eternal life is in the world to come. And not only that, Bill read that we have the promise of eternal life. And God cannot lie, so it's a reality if we remain faithful. That's exactly right. You know, the Bible teaches, and I think it's appropriate for us to point this out, the Bible teaches that Christians have security. Mm -hmm. The Bible does not teach that Christians have unconditional security. That's right. That's a terrible doctrine that's been propagated. There's folks that, um, and good people, the kind of people you'd want for your neighbors, they live above the doctrine of once saved, always saved. But the reality is that doctrine says it doesn't matter how you live. You can live any way you want, and you cannot be lost. Well, that becomes a very despicable doctrine, a a horrible doctrine. But the Bible does teach that we've got great security in Christ Jesus. In John chapter 10, 27 through 29, this is a passage that they oftentimes use, but it's, it's not their verse. Those who want to, um, let's go ahead and take this call. Arise the truth, you're on the air. Uh, yes, sir. It, isn't there a verse that says, uh, to know the true God and the Lord Jesus Christ, this is uh, life eternal? Or, or something like that. Yeah. Thank you. John 17, probably is the one he's alluding to. Let's, let's find that verse, guys. And and as Wesley was pointing out, is that John 17? I think it's like 17.4. Okay. 
uh, you know, the thing about it is we, we don't deny that we have eternal life, but right. in what sense do we have eternal life? You know, a 12-year-old, verse 2, okay. That they might know thee the only true God in thy son Jesus Christ whom thou sent. Uh, he should give eternal life to as many. Okay. I don't know if that's the verse he had in mind. Verse 3 says, and this is eternal life that we may know you, the only true God. Okay. This that's, is eternal life. That's verse, okay. So the reality is a 12-year-old could be uh, in uh, uh, an inheritance. Let's say uh, an uncle says, you know, I'm going to put that 12-year-old in my inheritance. And when that 12-year-old meets these specific qualifications mm -hmm. at age 21 if they've met those qualifications that 12 year old gets a million dollars does that million dollars belong to the 12 year old yes but in what sense promise. it's promise it's promise right and so we have eternal life but the reality is we can be disinherited yeah you know john said these things right on to you that you may know that you have eternal life and so we, we're not debating whether we have it or not. We do. But the question is, how do we have it? And John answers that question. And Wesley answered it by Scripture a while ago. But just think of back in the Old Testament when God said, I have given you Jericho. He didn't say, I will give you. He said, I have given you Jericho. He can speak of a thing as if it's already come to pass. Mm -hmm. And so God can say, I have given them eternal life. The question is how. And I think, fellas, sometimes we get, People get confused. They'll read a verse that says what they want it to say, but they don't look at the total context of the whole Word of God to see how a thing is done. So do we have eternal life? This panel says yes. The Word of God says yes. Mm -hmm. How do we have that to eternal life? When do we get that eternal life? And the answer to that question is when this world is over. Yes. With that in mind, let me address John 10, beginning with verse 27 that Bill brought up. I do something here with the students called the hot seat. And I will put three of them up front, and I will teach error as hard as I can teach error. Now, their job is to answer it. And we tell them, if you're going to look bad, we want you to look bad here, not out there, once you start your preaching and teaching career. Now watch John 10, 27, and I'm going to do to you what I do to the students. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall watch the language never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. And I asked the students, do you believe that? Well, yeah, but I can become unfaithful. Then I say, hold it. Are you a man? It says no man can pluck them out of my Father's hand. You can't do it. I can't do it. There's nobody living that can do it. But yet, you're trying to say that you can fall away and become unfaithful and jump out of the Father's hand or something so that you'll wind up lost. Now let's go back and look at the verses. And look at the answer. Look at verse 27 again. My sheep hear my voice. Now question number one. How long must we hear the voice of the Lord to be saved? All of our life. All of our life. And I know them. I recognize them. You got a call? Yeah, go ahead and wrap that up. Go ahead. Arise the truth. You're on the air. Arise the truth, you're on the air. Yeah, I like that verse Wesley just said, No, using the words, no man. One of my favorite verses is where it says, No man can come to the Father. Or to me, Jesus said, No man can come to me unless the Father 
draw him. That's right. I, I, so, we believe that. I like that. Well, yeah. I tell you what I we'll know. do. When, when Wesley finishes with John 10, 27 and following, we'll turn over to John chapter 6. That's a great verse. And we're going to deal with verse 44 and 45. Yep. We'll start, start, start about 43. Okay, fair enough. Through 66. Thank you. Okay. All right, we appreciate that call. Now notice my sheep hear my voice. That's a lifetime responsibility. And I know them. In other words, I recognize them. And they follow me. Now, what a person's got to do is find a verse that says you can quit following the Lord and still be saved. That verse is nowhere in God's word. And I give unto them eternal life. The question is, when is eternal life given in reality? And the world to come. We read that to you a moment ago. And they shall never perish. Or once you get it, and you've got eternal life in heaven, you're not going to perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. You're going to be secure there. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand, to which we say amen. That's the total security of the believer in eternity. What they're going to have to do is they're going to have to find a verse that says we can stop following, we can stop hearing, and we're still secure. And that, matter of fact, if they'd like to call in and give us that verse, we'd like to hear where that verse is. Eddie? Yeah, you know, when you look at what he's saying here, he's talking about sheep that continually hear and continually follow. That's right. Well, naturally, no man's going to pluck them out of the Father's hand. Can sheep be lost? Sure they can. Yeah, we have a parable of the lost sheep. You know, in uh, Luke chapter 15, which we sometimes call the lost chapter mm -hmm. because it deals with things that are lost. And, you know, one day a, a denominational preacher even said on this radio program, not this one, not the rise to truth, but on his own, he said, after you said all you want to say about the lost sheep, they were still lost. In the prodigal son, he said, this is my son that was lost. That's right. But is now found. So you can be lost, and Second Peter 2 teaches the same thing, how the latter end is worse. You'd been better off to never had a complete, thorough understanding and knowledge of the Word of God than after you have known it to turn. Well, you can't turn from something you've not been a part of. Turn from the holy commandment delivered unto you, but it's happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog has turned to his own vomit again, the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. We call that a spiritual tragedy. When one that has obeyed the gospel and knew the truth and then fall away from that, then that's a real tragedy to say the very least of it. Okay, Bill. All do right. You, do you believe a person has to be drawn to be saved? Oh, without a doubt. Without a doubt. Matter of fact, let's read those verses. Now, in fairness to our caller, we appreciate you wanting us to get it in context. We will probably not go to verse 66. If there's something that we're missing, you're welcome to call back. But we will go ahead and back up to verse number 43. Jesus therefore answered and said to them, Do not murmur among yourselves. Now here's his verse, and it's a great verse. We love this verse. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. And to that we say, Amen. But it raises a question that's answered in verse number 45. How does he draw Verse 45, it is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Now, this can be perfectly harmonized with all of New Testament Scripture. All of all Scripture is that that drawing process takes place through the teaching of God through His Word, in the Old Testament, it would have been through prophets. In the New Testament, through inspired men before we had the Word, and now we have the uh, complete New Testament. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. When we are studying the Bible, we are being taught by God. So everyone who has heard, we've got to listen to God, and learned from the Father comes to me. One more thing, and then I'll throw it back to you guys. It just occurred to me, the book of Colossians, it's rather amazing. 
Paul is not setting out to make this point. He says it in a matter-of-fact way, which I, oftentimes that's much more powerful. Mm -hmm. But it begins in verse number 45, or excuse me, verse 5 of Colossians chapter 1, because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before in the word of truth, the gospel, so they've heard it. And then you drop down to verse number 7, as also you learn from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, so what did they do? They heard the gospel message. They learned the gospel message. And we come to find out they obeyed the gospel message. Does someone have to be drawn, Eddie? Absolutely. Sure. The question is how. And, and, and it's through the teachings of the Word of God. Absolutely. You know, if you look at this whole context, even if you back that further, Bill, these are Jews that are murmuring. Mm -hmm. Well, who are Jews? Well, at that time, they were the ones in a covenant relationship with God. They're the ones, according to the doctrine of once saved, always saved, that could not have fallen, no matter what they did, because they were the called. They were the ones. But in that context, if you back up to 5, in chapter 5, he gives a number of witnesses, Jesus does, that he calls to the stand to testify to show the Jews their concept was wrong. They believed on him, but they wouldn't confess him. They wouldn't acknowledge him, as John, 10, or John 12 points out as well. And so what you've got is a group of people, quote, in a covenant relationship with God that have fallen from that covenant relationship with God. And it's to them that he's saying, if you want to come to God, you want to come to the Father, you've got to come by me. And if you want to come to me, you've got to come by the Father. And the only way you can do that, as he said out in chapter 5, is obey what the Father says. They said, well, we're Abraham's seed. He said, don't give me that. If you were Abraham's seed, you'd obey Abraham. Abraham didn't do to me what you are. And so these religious people, the Jews and others that were among the saved in a covenant relationship with God under the Old Testament system are the ones that's going to crucify him. And yet some people would say, well, they're God's chosen people, so it don't matter if they crucify him or not. They're among the elect. They're going to heaven. No, they're not. It never has been that way. It's always been stipulated obedience to God upon conditions. I would ask the gentleman in that context of John 6, to remember that he's talking to Jews. That's right. How were they in that covenant? They were born into that covenant, and then they were taught who God was. When, G when he asked about coming to God, Jesus said, you have to learn in the new covenant and come to God through him. He says the prophets in Jeremiah 31, 34, Jeremiah said, no more... This is when the days come, verse 31, I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. That's how, they, that's how a child was born. Eighth day he was circumcised and was taught by his, by his family who God was. In the new covenant that Jeremiah is talking about, it won't be that way. For they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. Jesus is teaching him, the Jews, what Jeremiah meant. In the old law, they were born physically. In the new law, we're born spiritually. We have to know who God is first. So he says to them, unless you hear and learn who I am and come to God through me by obedience, you won't be in, you won't be in the new covenant. Now, no. fellas, let me say this. And I might be mistaken. I don't think so. I think I recognize the voice of the caller. I've been privileged to be in his home, study the Bible with him. He's one of the greatest human beings I've ever been around. He's a great guy. His mentor was dying, and the caller said to his mentor that he was upset because his wife had not bought into the religion he is in now. And the mentor said this, don't be too concerned about her. She might be the one saved, and you and I might be the one lost. And the caller told me that, and he can call and say he didn't if he wishes to. So having said that, sir, here's my question. Were you drawn? How do you know you were drawn? And why did the mentor say to you, you could be lost if you were truly drawn? We need to know that you can help us 
if you'll call again. Wes, would they not have to say also that you could be drawn and uh, I mean among the elect without being drawn? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. whether you flip that coin and no matter where it lands, if you're a Calvinist, you, if you're called and you're drawn, or you're already saved before you're even born, then that coin's fixed. Absolutely. Regardless I of what you do. I don't know how many hours I studied with his mentor. I was in his home time and time again. And the point is, his mentor assured me that a fellow could be saved and never obey God. And he even admitted Adolf Hitler. Mm -hmm. Madeline Murray O'Hare might be saved. Well, why? To show the wonderful grace of God. To whom? Now, you think about that. And I asked him, the mentor, why God would show grace to some and not others. And to show how loving he is was his answer. Loving to whom? Right. Just those that God chose to save and condemned everybody else to hell. You know, in human relationships, and I don't mean to be too harsh here, but just so we understand what they're actually saying about God, in human relationships, we would call that abusive and maybe even rape. A young man decides, you're going to be my wife. No, I'm not going to be your wife. And he will take her hostage and lock him up in the basement, and we would all think, that is an absolute beast. But the Calvinist says, no, that shows the loving sovereignty of God. No, no, that's not the God of the Bible. That's a, that is a monster. Hey, guys, let's move on just a little bit. Let's move down to verse number two some more, and let's look at this phrase, God, uh, well, let's just start back up. In hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began. Let's talk about that phrase, cannot lie. How in the world is it that God is incapable of lying, Wesley? Well, it's against his nature. See, the atheist wants to know, is a thing moral because God says it's moral? Or is a thing moral regardless of what God thinks about it? Well, the answer is neither one. Morality flows from the very nature of God. That's right. Who he is. And since he is the awesome, sovereign God of this universe, he cannot lie. There's some things God cannot do. I preached a sermon here a while back, things God cannot do. And a little boy said to his mother, he's blown this one, <laughs> you know, to think that God can't do some things. You know, God can't make a round square, as we understand roundness and squareness. God cannot make a car that's bigger on the inside than it is the outside. God cannot make a rock that's so big he can't pick it up. You know, these are what we call logical contradictions. And God does not get involved in logical contradiction, neither does he get involved in that which is called immorality. Now, as we think about this, fellas, it being true that God cannot lie. As a matter of fact, over in Galatians chapter 1, beginning at verse 6, there Paul lays it down. You cannot change the gospel. And there are folks that are saying, well, now, wait a minute. You know, we don't know how God's going to save everyone. Well, that would turn God into a liar. Right. In Galatians chapter 1, beginning at verse number 6, I marvel that you're turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another. But there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. Eddie, I know there are folks out there that have said things like, I know Mark 16, 16 says, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. But I'm not going to tie the hands of God 
and say that he couldn't save someone <coughs> in another fashion. Well, they got a real problem on their hands. Yeah, they do. We're not going to tie God's hands either. But God can tie his own hands when he makes a statement that this is the way it is. He's not going to change his mind because he never makes a bad choice, never makes a wrong decision. When he told Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die, he meant exactly what he said. Adam could have said, well, I'm, I'm the only guy in this world. He'll make an exception in my case, and if he does, then they won't even want to know it but just me and him anyway. Well, God's not going to make an exception in anyone's case. And the day they ate thereof, in dying, they will surely die. And so God means what he says. When he says in Mark 16 that you mentioned there, if you believe and are baptized, you shall be saved. If you believe not, you'll be condemned. That's what he means. And he's not going to make an exception in my case. I remember in college one time in a philosophy class, we had a guy that made up God is a big deceiver. And everything he's telling you is just lies, and you, you're buying it. You're just believing it. And he is the great deceiver. Well, if there's nothing, but no boundaries, God's essence and God's nature, then he could be just deceiving a world. But because God works in harmony with his nature, is that very being and essence, then we come to the assurance of knowing what he says. He means you can take that to the bank. And sometimes we don't consider what God is uh, able to do. All right, we've got a call. A rise of truth, you're on the air. Yeah, since uh, Eddie went all the way back to the Garden of Eden, I was wondering uh, when Adam and Eve sinned, they tried to cover their nakedness with uh, leaves or uh, something like that. But yeah. then God started off, uh, he, he must have did an animal sacrifice because he covered them with skins of animals, I, I guess. You might be able to tell me more about that. But does that mean that Adam and Eve weren't lost and were in God's covenant. Now I'll listen to you. Thank All you. Right. Well, when God said the day you eat of this fruit, you shall surely die. When they ate of that fruit, they surely died. In what sense? Well, we get messed up on this idea of death and right. we think of annihilation, but it's not. It's separation. You know, James Rogers one time in a lecture at White Oak in Chattanooga said the Hebrew expression there in dying, you shall surely die. It says that in dying, you shall surely die. If you partake of this tree of knowledge, and that's what happened. There was no death before that, but when he, they partook of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, they set into motion, and in dying they shall surely die. But, well, they, but they were dead in another sense. Yes, yeah, spiritually. That, spiritually they were dead. Well, fellas, if Calvinism is true, it didn't matter <laughs> where they ate from the tree or not. That's exactly. They were either elected to be saved from all eternity or elected to be lost. So it didn't make any difference what they did. And if Calvinism is true, that all things are predestined, then God predestined them to eat of the fruit. And then God turned around and condemned them for what he predestined them to do. Now that's ridiculous, to say the least. Yeah, that's, just, that's just a fallacy of that, of that argument, of that position is that it contradicts just about every verse in the Bible. There's, yeah. there's not a principle that it doesn't contradict. There's, there's hardly a verse it doesn't contradict because God says, come to me and you'll have eternal life. Well, if you can't come, and then God's lying and de deceiving. So it's, that's just, it's ludicrous, really. It sure now, is. The, now, the beautiful thing about that passage right there, and I want to deal with something that that man said. Yes, they were lost. But God had the capability to bring them back into relationship, and not just Adam and Eve, but all humanity. Okay, we got a call. Arise the truth, you're on the air. Well, you're not quite answering my question. My okay. question was, they tried to cover their own sins by their own works of, of covering their nakedness. You didn't get to my point. My point was God did the animal sacrifice and clothed them. I wanted to know... At that point, were they going to heaven when they died? Thank you. All right. Well, I don't know that they were trying to redeem themselves. They were ashamed of themselves. Yes. But why don't you go ahead and jump in there? Well, we don't know where they repented or they didn't repent. Mm -hmm. I mean, now I agree with the caller to some degree. I think God required an animal sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And probably they did offer one. And God, not wanting to be wasteful, then took the skin 
and made clothing out of it. So I think, sir, you are right on that point. But I don't believe that they, in some way that they were trying to earn their salvation. Oh, no. I, I, no. And, sir, I don't want to misrepresent no, you. No, not, but I not think, at all. Uh, but I kind of got the idea that maybe he was saying they tried to get the job done, couldn't get it done. God's got to get it done, and therefore God's got to get it done today. Well, we would argue from the Scriptures we cannot contribute one cent toward the payment of our salvation. That's right. But we must trust and obey. Yes. Whatever he says we must do, we must do. And naturally, they were trying to pass the buck. Mm -hmm. You know, the wife you gave me, she's at fault. The wife blames Satan. The devil made me do it. And so, yes, they did try to pass the buck somewhat. But the truth is there's a right way and a wrong way to cover sin. And the covering sin the wrong way is trying to do it your way. The right way is listening to what God says. Brother Clayton Winters, years ago at a preacher's meeting, you probably remember, you probably have gone over this with Clayton. He talked about the word atonement, mm -hmm. and the idea is to cover. And it's exactly what you were talking about. A lot of people recognize they may not have the word atonement in their mind, but they realize they need to cover their sins. Some people try to cover up their sins and pretend that it never happened. Some people try to cover it by doing enough good deeds to outweigh the bad deeds. That'll never get it done. They, might switch, they might switch congregations. Oh, yeah. Get in a capsule and fly to the moon as I've tried to get some to do. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> regardless of that, you we're, you got to cover them the God's way. We're not told in Genesis 3 if God had given them revelation yet as to do as to what to do when they had sinned but That's we right. know by genesis 4 mm -hmm. god had given them revelation because uh, cain and abel came cain brought only from the first fruits of the flock of the ground then the bible says abel also brought the firstlings of the flock and god did not have any respect to cain's offering because it wasn't by faith but hebrews 11 4 says right. abel offered by faith a, a more excellent sacrifice so we know by genesis 4 God gave them the revelation. That's what they needed to do to, to, to make atonement. We don't know in Genesis 3, but I think, I think his grace and love, he allowed those animals to die for them, but then told them, now from now on, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission right. of sins. Right. Well, I still would like for the caller to tell me, was he drawn? If so, how was he drawn? How did he know he was drawn? And why wouldn't that establish the fact that he would definitely know that he is among the elect? And if he is among the elect, how does he know that? And we'd like to know the four speakers on this program. Sir, do you think we're among the elect? And if not, what got us in the non-elect class? And if we're in the non-elect class, can we ever get out of the non I like class. David Irick held a gospel meeting here at the Stony Creek Church of Christ. I guess it's been about two years ago. And he made a statement in one of those lessons that I thought was excellent. He said, Christianity is a thinking man's religion. And it really is. And it may sound, and it shouldn't, it may sound a little bit cold or clinical, but Christianity is a learned religion. It is. And I, you know, I've made this point a few times recently. God is so considerate. He doesn't ask us to do the bizarre. He doesn't ask us to respond to him ignorantly. He says, here's the data. Study the evidence. Look at this. Now, in any other relationship in life, we realize if we're going to make a commitment, we've got to know the other individual. We've got to know something about that other individual. Well, God says, that's only reasonable. I want you to study about me. Learn about me. And you make a decision. You render a verdict of belief or unbelief. And so that's the whole point of John 6, 45. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. That's what Jesus said. Now, therefore, yes, the Father draws us in the most thoughtful, considerate way that we can imagine. He doesn't say, now... You're just going to have this feeling, and you're going to have to guess about it. We could tell story after story after story uh, from history and personal experiences about individuals that were grieved because they never had the personal experience that they thought they were supposed to have to prove that they were among the elect. 
Uh, we know individuals that have been connected with this congregation. Uh, Chester Bullard, who was a preacher up in Snowville, Virginia, when he was a young boy, he was so distraught because at that time, all the Calvinists said, if you're among the elect, you will have an experience. Something will happen, will, will validate that you're among the elect. And he was so distraught. He didn't want to live anymore because he didn't ever have an experience. Well, that would be horrible if God did that. Amen. He says, no, I'm going to give you an objective standard. You can look at the Bible. You can learn about me. You can find out what it is that I expect of you. And then I'll give you a great objective standard. Now, by this, we do know that we know him. If we keep his commandments, 1 John 2 and verse 3. You know, Bill, in the Church of God of Prophecy, Wesley and I were in for a while. They had what they called a mourner's bench. And you would go down to the mourner's bench and pray, and there'd be people all over your praying with you, praying for you that you'd get that feeling. And we based our salvation upon a feeling you feel when you feel a feeling you never felt before. That sounds kind of complicated, but that's what they believed, really. You would be surprised, and they don't usually tell this, but... You would be surprised at how many people that got up from that mourner's bench that didn't feel that feeling and left crying because God would not save them. Even though they stayed there on their knees maybe for 30 minutes to an hour, begging God, begging God, and begging God to save them. And God said, no, I'm not going to do it. Now, what kind of God does that? The point is, Start with, it's the wrong plan of salvation. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. He says in John 6 that we've read and talked about, he gives us eternal life when we're drawn to him by the Father. And when we do that, those things, then we know we are doing what God says. And that's a big difference in what the denominational world is saying. Ed, and that's one of the things that led you and me out of that Absolutely. religion. Absolutely. To see people there begging, begging, and pleading with God, please save me. And the Godhead begging them, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. All right, let's get this call. A rise to truth, you're on the air. I'll have to say that I did go to the Pentecostal churches for almost 10 years, and all they base their why their belief sign was uh, the baptism in the Holy Spirit with evidence of speaking in tongues. But once I started reading the Bible for myself, I could only see one time where uh, a Gentile spoke in tongues. It was uh, Cornelius uh, uh, speaking there with uh, Peter. And I can't find another Gentile nowhere in the New Testament speaking in tongues. But that was a sign because Jews, they, they, they were seeking signs. And that was a sign to Peter that the Gentiles had the Holy Spirit the same as they did. Mm -hmm. And after that, it, I never see it no more. And that's one of the reasons I come out of the Pentecostal church. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. We're still asking you, sir, were you drawn? And by what method were you drawn? How do you know you were drawn? And were you drawn to start with into the Pentecostal church? Now, he made this statement to me. Wesley, I used to be just as wrong as you are. But I changed. In other words, he became a hardcore Calvinist. And I said this to him. If your doctrine is true, while you were in the Pentecostal church, you were just as saved as you are right now because your salvation was determined from all eternity, chosen by God Almighty and not you. Now, you think about that. That's where he is, bless his heart. He's a great guy. This is one superhuman being. I can't tell you how nice and, and have you noticed his attitude and calling? What a great guy. That's his attitude when you're in his home or when you're around him, a superhuman being. We just want to try to call him back to the Bible. And notice, he said he started studying tongues and studied himself out of it. Sir, that's what we believe everybody can do. Right. We don't think we have a special handle on truth, 
we think anybody out there who wants to pick up his or her Bible and study it can come to a knowledge of the truth. Boy, isn't that great that God has designed salvation in such a way that all can be drawn and ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Let's think about this, going back to this idea of God cannot lie. You know, there's a lot of passages, and it ties together with this idea of Calvinism. Incidentally, let me mention this. Here at the school, we have a third-year class, a whole quarter, on the subject of Calvinism. And I've had people ask me, why in the world would you do that? Calvinism's dead. No, there is a resurgent. Yes. Uh, a resurgence on this particular doctrine. It's been rebranded, and they're trying to be uh, perhaps a little more sophisticated. They call it Reformed theology, but it's the same thing. Now, think about this. If it is true that God cannot lie, how are we going to deal with some of these verses? Now, one of their, the tenets of their particular doctrine is that of limited atonement. Jesus did not die for everyone. Well, listen to 1 John 2 and verse number 2. And he himself is the propitiation. Uh, that's the idea of appeasement, satisfaction, payment. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Who? The whole world. Now, we got a real problem here. If Calvinism is true, then God's lied. That's God right. says... Through the Holy Spirit inspired the writer John to write, Jesus died for everyone. Now, this is a beautiful thought. This is mind-blowing. If you stop and you think about it, you mentioned Madeline Murray O'Hare and, and uh, I think of Carl Sagan, Adolf Hitler, and all these people. Now, this is mind-blowing. Jesus died, and he paid the price, 100% paid the price for the most sinful ungodly reprobate that there's ever been. Now, that doesn't mean they're saved, but he paid the price. Now, there's preachers out there that say, no, Jesus wouldn't waste a drop of his blood on them. But in reality, they talk about showing the greatness of the grace of God. That's what shows the greatness of the grace of God. That's their argument, Bill, I was going to make. Is God wasteful? Mm. Well, what's your answer? No. Well, why would he allow Jesus to die for people that he's known from all eternity is going to go to hell. What good is that going to do? Well, here's the good it's going to do. If I wind up going to hell, I will know that somebody loved me enough to die for me, and I spit in his face. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I was studying with a Calvinist on one particular occasion, and I asked him, about this very verse right here. And he said, well, let me get back to you. And he came back, and this is what he said, because he realized he had a problem. And we know God doesn't lie, so how is he going to answer it? And he said, the point is that he's the propitiation for our sins and for the whole elect world. Now, they had to insert that word, elect world. Well, where do you get that word? Well, we know that that's what it's got to be. And we've got to be careful. We've got to be careful of this. Calvinists have to be careful of this, but we have to be careful of this as well. They'll take their template, lay it on the Bible, and if the Scripture doesn't fit into their template, they force the Scripture into their template to make it say what they want it to say. I had a brother in the flesh that died, and uh, he just was so upset with me because I taught that you could fall from grace. And he called me up one night, and we we're going through a series of passages, and we went over to Hebrews 6. I was really reluctant to go to Hebrews 6, but I went there. And I was shocked that it gave him a hard time. And he said, hold on, hold on, hold on. And he went, and he got some commentary, and I wish I knew what commentary it was. And he read the answer, because it says there that if someone falls away, it's impossible to renew them again under repentance. And he read it, and the writer says, now it would appear that the writer is saying that someone could fall from grace. But since we know that's not true, what he is saying, and I said, wait a minute, where did you get that? Well, that's, that's what it is. We know that's not true. What are you basing that on? Give me some other Bible. We can't just rewrite the Bible to make it fit our particular doctrine. In, in the book that we're studying, the verse that we started with was 2.13, but if you go back to 2.11, it says, For the grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared unto 
all men. That's right. It doesn't say only the elect. That's right. It says it appeared unto all men. That's right. Now, yeah. Hebrews 2.9, they got a major problem with it. The Bible says, but we see Jesus who is made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor that he by the grace of God, now watch it, should taste death for every man. Are you sure that's not taste death for every elect man? No, it says for every man. In every man, does that mean every man? That means every man. Okay. I would have an idea they probably love John 3, 16, for, God's, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, so loved the world. It didn't say the elect world. He loved the world. Yeah. You, when we begin to take our man-made doctrines and force them into the Bible, you talk about perverting the Bible. We have to be ever so careful about that. Now, what they do with John three sixteen, the caller's mentor told me this. That is the elect world, because the word world is used various ways in the Bible, and it is. But notice it gets them in a major jam. Now let's read it their way. For God so loved the elect world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now notice what you got to do to have everlasting life. You got to believe. It still will not fit their doctrine. Right. If that makes salvation conditional, and they've got salvation being unconditional. Makes it conditional to the elect world, too. So like yeah, you that's said, what I'm saying. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth him in the elect world that's right. should not perish. Well, if he's in the elect world, he couldn't perish anyway, <laughs> according right. to their doctrine. But, uh, of course, it's not true according to the Bible. That's right. Well, as we see... God cannot lie. What a beautiful thing when we begin to realize that we serve a gracious, loving God. Let me, let me ask him one more time. We're running out of time. Were you drawn? And by what method were you drawn? How do you know you were drawn? When you were in the Pentecostal world, were you drawn? Now are you drawn into the religion that you're currently in? Let's think about this other phrase. We haven't gotten very far into the text. But let's look at this phrase, promised made before the world began. Uh, now let's think about that for a second because this is really a beautiful, beautiful reality. And there's several verses that we could go to. Revelation 13 and verse 8 is one of those mind-blowing verses where he says there, he speaks of the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. To stop and think, God has that capability of looking forward. He already had the plan in place. He knew exactly what was going to happen. He knew exactly how he was going to take care of it. And what's, what's really amazing to me is when you go over to Romans, you begin to get the idea, beginning about verse number 21, he talks about demonstrating his righteousness. He demonstrated that he did the right thing by sending Jesus to the cross to die for all mankind. And when was that plan? Well, you know the premillennial dispensationalists, they're going to say that God was wringing his hands because he didn't expect it. Yeah. But the passage said it was promised before the world began. Yeah, and I want to go to the next point. And this caller's mentor, boy, he made it rough on me on this verse. And I had to think seriously about it. Revelation 17:8. The beast that was thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend down to the bottomless pit, and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. The question is, to all of you, when was your name put in the Lamb's book of life? This verse says, from the foundation of the world. That's either true or false. Well, it's true. That's from God's perspective. He knows who's in there, who's going to be in there at the end of the world from our perspective when we obeyed the gospel of Christ. Tell yeah. us, you've hit on this, but let's talk real quickly. We could just have a little bit of time left. The difference between foreknowledge and something being predetermined. Well, you can have foreknowledge, 
Let's say Judas Iscariot portraying the Lord and the prophecy that says my own familiar friend, you know, has denied me, betrayed me. Uh, once that was made, that's the way it was going to turn out. But it was made only because God knew what was going to happen out here. That's right. See, God could look out there and say, oh, I see what Judas Iscariot's going to do. So I'm going to go ahead and tell the world what Judas Iscariot's going to do. And, but God didn't make Judas Iscariot do it. Jesus was crucified before the foundation of the world. Well, when was he crucified? On the cross. That's from man's perspective. But from the very beginning, even before time, he was crucified then in the mind of God because God knows all things. That's right. Think about a God that brilliant that he knows everything. He knows all the thoughts of all the men everywhere, all the time, and it doesn't even keep him busy. That's how great God is. Just keeping Bill's thoughts straightened, that would be a handful. Oh. That would be a marvelous thing. <laughs> Rhonda can't even keep no, up that. No, not even close. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we appreciate so much you being a part of the program. To Amen. the caller, thank you for calling in. We're on every Tuesday and Thursday from 2 to 3 and we appreciate not only you being part of the program, but you call us up and put our feet to the fire. And you, you put the heat on us and, and hold us uh, to the standard. As we have said for years and years and years, do not take our word for anything. Make us prove it by the scriptures. We can all be wrong, but God's word will never be wrong. That's right. Our great desire for you is to be a child of God to enjoy all the blessings that are in Christ Jesus. You can do that if you'll allow God to draw you by hearing from him, learning from him, accepting the evidence of Scripture, John chapter 8 and verse number 24, repenting of every sin, Luke 13, 3 and 5, and then uh, confessing your faith in Christ, Matthew 10, 32 and 33, and then being <coughs> baptized for the forgiveness of sins. Thank you for being with us and join us again for the Arise to Truth radio program. Now, those of you that are still joining us by Facebook and by YouTube, we appreciate so much you two joining the program today and studying with us from the book of Titus. We hope that you've been benefited. Remember, you can email us with any question that you may have or contact us here at Arise to Truth. We would be happy to have your comments, your Bible questions, or whatever you may have to consider to keep on studying God's precious Word. Also, this coming Thursday, we'll be back on from 2 to 3. We hope you'll be joining us at that time. We appreciate our good listeners. We appreciate the caller today and the comments that have been made. It's always a joy to be on Arise to Truth and have the opportunity of teaching His holy and divine will. We're good. Okay. We appreciate all of you. All of you all stay put for just a moment. I'd like to take the opportunity to mention a couple of things to you. Uh, this program is a great asset to the, to the community. Well, matter of fact, let me say this. We have had callers from England. We have had callers from California. I believe we had someone from Canada recently, didn't we? Philippines. Philippines. But our main aim is just anybody that needs to hear the gospel. Having said that, it is also a great asset to the school. But it costs money. It costs money in terms of our equipment that we have. It costs money in terms of the airtime. So if any of y'all would like to write us a check for $7,200, that will pay for our airtime for next year. Don't laugh like that. They'll think I'm not serious. <laughs> but we do need, and it may be that you're able to go back to your congregation and say, you know what? We need to help support the Arise to Truth radio program. It's great for our students. It's great for the community. It's an effort to get the gospel out there. And so anything you can do to help us along that line. We've got needs, as you can see. If you would rather write us a check for $1.2 million, we'll be able to start on our apartments right away. Please pray for us. Thank you for supporting us through your prayers, your attendance, and everything that you do. Robbie Sr.'s home. Oh, my goodness. I'm glad you said that. 
we need to have, will you offer a prayer? Well, actually, yeah, offer a prayer for Robbie Sr. Robbie Eversall Sr. will be having surgery tomorrow. He is getting a pacemaker and Thursday. defibrillator. Thursday. Defibrillator. He'll have it on Thursday. Yes, go for I was it. already ready for this to be the last day of the lecture, so <laughs> not really. Uh, so Robbie Sr. will be having surgery on Thursday for a pacemaker and defibrillator. He loves the school so much. They wanted to do it last week, and he said, nope, I've got to go to Tri-City School of Preaching and speak. And he came on and was here for several days and left today. Would you offer a prayer on his behalf? Our Father in heaven, we come into your presence thanking you for life itself. We thank you for all the blessings that have been given to us. We're thankful that in your great mercy and love and wisdom, that you allowed your grace to be shown in the appearing of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, for all men, all men. We pray, Father, that we will endeavor to live, that we, de that we deny ungodliness and worldly lust, and we live soberly, righteously, and godly with you in this world. Father, we pray and thank you for this radio program. Thank you for the school. Thank you for the elders that oversee the school, and also thank you so much for our supporters who allow us to be here. Father, we're mindful this hour of Robbie. We're thankful that he had a safe journey back to his home. We pray as he gets ready to do the pre-op tomorrow and the doctor does the work on Thursday, we pray that the efforts that they put forth to put the defibrillator and, and pacemaker in will give Robbie energy. It will extend his life for many years that he may be able to serve you as he has in the past and as he wants to now. Father, bless him and his wife. Draw him close to your side and be with his doctors as they rest the next couple of nights that on, the, on Thursday morning they'll arise if time continues and do, a, do what they need to do according to their ability and their talent. We pray Robbie's body will accept that and we pray through your will that he will be healed and have more strength and more energy to serve you. Father, we thank you and we love you. We thank you for your son. In his name we pray. Amen. 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 Let me encourage you, if you're coming to the dinner tonight, let's get here a little early and you can fellowship in the library and then hopefully we'll start uh, serving promptly at 530. You are dismissed. <laughs>